Good morning. Hi, good morning. Hi, Alessandra. Good morning. Uh, hi, Elizabeth. Uh, I, I do suppose that you speak Italian? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, okay. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, non ero sicura neanche io, ma poi... Eh, molto... Non si sa mai. Molto piacere. Molto piacere, grazie mille per l'invito. Eh. No, e grazie a voi, è veramente... Sono molto contenta e anche un po' emozionata, devo dire, vista la situazione di, di, avervi, di avervi con noi oggi. Quindi, grazie. Eh, grazie, io non sto guardando le news per potermi concentrare perché le news non sono buone oggi. No. Eh, insomma. Ok, io non so se vogliamo fare un tentativo di condivisione dello schermo. Per uh, sicurezza? Sì, io non gestisco niente, nel senso okay. che... <ride> Quindi... Aspetto calda. Uh, prova e se poi per caso c'è qualcosa che non va aspettiamo calda. Ok, ok. Vediamo un po'. Ah, sta funzionando, mi pare. Ok, vediamo se va al full screen che a volte non funziona. Ok, non funziona. Qua. Ho l'interfaccia. Ok, no, no, no. Bene. Ok. Adesso dovrebbe vedersi il full screen, giusto? Uh, ancora no. Uh... Allora, vuol dire che non uh, è questa la finestra. Facciamo così. Così dovrebbe vedersi. Eh, il così sì, così è perfetto. Ok, vediamo, faccio un po' di avanti e indietro, si vede? Uh, secondo me sì, ok, perfetto. Ok, magari sì, vado più. C'è un piccolo quando... delle, un piccolo... Mh, in ritardo, okay. due, tre, due tre secondi tra, tra quando credo immagino schiacci e quando passa alla, alla slide successiva, ma funziona. Ok, ok, so va. Beh, io magari a questo punto lascio in condivisione e basta. Eh, perfetto. E attendiamo... Uh, sì, no? magari qualche minuto perché so che gli studenti hanno um, corso prima. E, no quindi secondo me hanno bisogno di giusto 5 minuti per trovare un posto, immagino, sistemarsi. Uh... Quando, quando volete, io adesso mi metto solo in muto. E, e... Perfetto. Ok, a fra poco. Grazie mille. Uh... Um, Elisabetta, posso sì. giusto per, per conferma, eh, la sessione sono 75 minuti in tutto col Q&A oppure sono se massimo 75 minuti no, della mia abbiamo, presentazione? No, abbiamo due ore, uh, fino okay. ore alle 12.30, quindi gestisci tu il tempo nel senso che uh, Secondo me puoi andare per, secondo me se teniamo una ventina di minuti alla fine uh, per un dibattito, cioè immagino che avere un dibattito su questo sia importante uh, okay. un po' per tutti, okay. ma um, gestisci i tuoi tempi, nel senso che uh, 
Pre pre prendete tutto il tempo di cui avete bisogno, ecco. Ok, ok, <ride> grazie mille, non Perfetto, voglio ucciderli. No, <ride> no sono, sono, sono resistenti comunque. <ride> eh, il mass mausp, maulp eh, è, un, è, è come andare a fare l'host. <ride> Ok, allora fra pochissimo. Sì, immagino ci sarà anche uh, Sebastian, uh, in teoria mi aveva detto che forse riusciva a connettersi. Ok. Che Spero forse magari sì. conoscete. Uh, no Ciao English, io. yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, we will switch to English in, in like three minutes. <laughs> This is not yeah, yeah. officially started uh, the lecture, so we are yeah, hello. In, the make, in the making of. <laughs> Sorry, we had an Italian parenthesis here. <laughs> this Italian is Italian recently in this very days. How, however, um, um, I think it's important for us to put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a strong context what is happening and what it means uh, uh, to stay, live and, and work in Palestine. So, okay, let's very uh, very basically starting from a geographical point of view here is uh, where we are and in particular uh, we are located currently in the in the city of Nablus uh, the, that is where i'm talking to you uh, from today we when we are talking about palestine i think it's now it has become notorious to everyone um, that uh, palestine is enduring an occupation since 1948 an occupation that is uh, that is enacted by uh, uh, the israeli the israeli state so but what does it mean actually to have a very long occupation we are in uh, uh, the long colonial context of the contemporary history. Uh, so uh, we have two levels of the problem. One is the very direct presence of the Israeli occupation. And later on, I will also show you the second level that is brought with a longstanding uh, occupation and a military uh, occupation campaign. Very, very quickly, the Palestinian history is very long to explain, but I think that this graphs is going to explain and specialize also uh, very in a, in a straightforward way how uh, things were in 1917 uh, uh, before uh, the, the uh, establishment of the Israeli state. So uh, Palestine was belonging for centuries to the Ottoman Empire, okay? So, uh, and this 1917 territory that you see is the one that was handed in, in, uh, in that was uh, actually occupied by um, the British mandate when the Ottoman Empire fell. Okay, so after a few years uh, of um, uh, the, uh, the British mandate, uh, we had in 1948 uh, the establishment of uh, the Israeli state that was, let's say, based on the Balfour Declaration, something that was actually um, uh, way older than 1948, it's around 1910, okay? So uh, the Balfour Declaration, that is the, the basis on which uh, the Israeli state was established on this very territory, was already uh, existing in 1917, okay? In, in around the 1920s, it was already well established. So here you can see, going to the present, how the Palestinian lands uh, shrank uh, to today's, uh, today's map in red. It's very, very smaller. So just to give you an idea about the proportion, as I don't know uh, also how many of you are, are familiar with the local, uh, with the local geography, Uh, Palestine before 1948 uh, had an extension of 20, uh, around 26-27,000 kilometers squares. Currently, the occupied Palestine, so uh, considering the West Bank and Gaza, um, uh, covers a 6,000 kilometers squares. It is the, uh, less than the 30% 
of its in initial extension. You can compare it with Flanders. Uh, Flanders is around 13 kilometer squares. So we are less than a half at the Flanders. Uh, as about the, the West Bank, I start zooming in in our uh, very context. Uh, I will not talk about Gaza. I, um, I do not uh, take this entitlement. Uh, we could never work there, as perhaps someone of you knows uh, who works and lives and, 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 and uh, uh, citizens from the West Bank are not allowed to go to Gaza and uh, and and uh, the way around, despite of officially being uh, in the same state. So, um, uh, as for the West Bank, where we are now, uh, it is uh, 5,600 uh, 5, kilometers square. So you also can understand how small Gaza is in comparison. But officially, from this are this are official um, official uh, numbers. But if you go on the ground, actually the 29% of these kilometer squares are confiscated by settlements and army outposts that you can see in this map on the right. The, the map is from uh, uh, the UN and OCHA agency. Uh, you can find it online very easily. So what is left actually um, is is a uh, 70%, uh, uh, but, uh, since uh, the Oslo Accords, uh, the, the agreements uh, that were signed in the 90s, uh, we only have actually a 61%, uh, 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 we have a 65% that is actually uh, under the Israeli administrative and security control. Why? Because uh, the Israel, the um, Oslo Accords, uh, as a uh, transitional uh, uh, geography, established the division of uh, of uh, the West Bank, the West Bank only, in three main um, uh, three main zones that you can see in uh, the shades of uh, of orange and yellow. Okay, and you can see it in. Uh, um, um, in the key map. So here we have a zoom in on our area, so you can also see it a little bit better. Uh, so uh, um, you can see that actually um, the area A is a very small extension of on, on this map, and that is the area that is actually under the total Palestinian control. So it's administration which means that if I have to apply for a building license, I, my interface and the authority is going to be a Palestinian one and the security authority. So it means that if I have any kind of problem of security or, or any issue, it's going to be a Palestinian security force to intervene. Whatever is in the beige area, uh, the area B, it's basically uh, uh, hatches uh, some agglomeration, some of the agglomeration of uh, um, uh, of rural villages. There, the security is under the Israeli administration, which means that who is going to intervene if if, if needed are going to be the Israeli army and not and not Palestinian police or pa Palestinian security forces. And the rest are Area C. So uh, that covers uh, um, uh, a huge uh, amount of this land. And there, both secu security and administrative uh, authorities are Israelis. Again, which means that uh, if I have to ask for a permit to, uh, I don't know, dig, dig a well or build my house or make renovations, I will have to apply to an Israeli authorities, despite being inside the, the um, uh, territories that were agreed as part of, of Palestine. The Israeli accords were supposed to expire uh, a few years ago, uh, but actually the trend and uh, there was a five-year transition period that um, uh, was supposed to uh, gradually hand in all, all the other territories within the West Bank to the Israeli, uh, to the, the Palestinian Authority, sorry, but this five years transition never happened. So the things stayed like this for 30 years. This is one of the reasons why now we have uh, the war out, outburst. Uh, 
if we look at if we focus very quickly uh, on uh, the the black holes or the, the dark uh, the dark spots those are all uh, uh, Israeli uh, settlements. Actually, this map is rather old because in the last couple of years with the, with the new administration, we had an outburst also of many new settlements. They are all positioned on um, uh, on hillside. On uh, oh, sorry, uh, they are all positioned on uh, the top of hillsides, so to provide a control, a full control of uh, uh, the, the Palestinian inhabited area. So you really feel uh, observed all the time. There is not, I think, a window on in in Palestinian houses, or there is not a Palestinian apartment that doesn't have at least a view on either uh, an Israeli settlement or a military outpost. Uh, here, uh, Shem uh, summarized very well also how the everyday is the core uh, um, the core target of the colonial project. So while tactics, destructive tactics, military tactics, um, uh, etc., at time have little military or strategic value, they actually relate to the attempt to erase an, the everydayness and its sides, which means that to, to try not to have uh, a routine. The unpredictability in this site is very, very high. We never know what happens uh, the day after. Just as an example, um, uh, at the beginning of the war, the, the night before, we just visited our uh, my in-laws uh, for uh, a weekend uh, and um, we could never go back so far. Uh, so we live just 40 kilometers away, uh, but we could never return to, to our house because uh, uh, roads are full of block blockages uh, and we are witnessing uh, many attacks on the ground also in the, in the Palestinian context. So uh, this is uh, here just to, to give you an idea on uh, an account of uh, the Palestinian fatalities between 2018 and uh, the day before uh, the uh, war on Gaza started. So here we have an amount of uh, six thousand of beyond six thousand uh, Palestinians uh, killed in the last five years, uh, of which uh, uh, still many are uh, on the in the West Bank. The second level of the uh, of the uh, long term uh, colonial project is the influence of uh, the international presence. That um, I would say it is a very important part of the way we conceived Yalla project and the way we operate. So I think it is time uh, to have a very frank. Uh, reflection uh, on um, the the influence that uh, foreign um, that foreign agencies bring not only on Palestine. I think that was what is happening since the 10th of October is also unveiling in a quite a, quite a brutal way, in a shocking way, the fact that um, inter the international presence in a colonial and post-colonial context still has a, um, a noticeable influence and also holds a responsibility of uh, in uh, keeping uh, the local instability. Also before the war in Palestine, very recently we had the crisis in uh, in Nigeria. We also we, uh, we are also witnessing the conflict in Congo and so on and so forth. So but I think that what is happening recently has really brought to the fore what are uh, what are we doing as internationals abroad when we go and work in international projects? I think this is very important to tackle in this lecture specifically as uh, for you who are attending uh, the Master of Human Settlements or the MAUP, many of you in the future might be joining the ranks of international projects or might be joining ranks of uh, uh, local academies or uh, of uh, local governmental um, uh, agencies. And it's very important to situate ourselves in a frank and honest way. Let's go back to uh, the extension of uh, uh, of the palestinian lands you you saw that uh, uh, the the west bank region is 
less than half of the Flanders. And nevertheless, we have more than 440 NGOs operating here of several kinds on, on different uh, topics, often overlapping. Uh, it's a kind of a jungle to navigate uh, in this. So um, talking from the field, from our five years experience now, but also from our previous uh, experiences uh, as co-founders and myself, I, I would like maybe to rest one second also on, on my own positioning, being a foreign, in Palestine, so I'm I'm doing also a lot of self self critiquing, and self investigation. That it's something that I really invite you all to do, uh, whatever is your position in in the the, the, the places where you're working. Um, but um, I was working in the past in uh, uh, the international cooperation alongside and within international agencies of various kinds from Europe uh, specifically. Um, in the West Bank. Um, and uh, the notes that you're going to see are the, the outcomes of not only these five years, but also of, uh, of, of I would say, 15 years and more uh, experience uh, in this sense. From uh, a mere uh, monetary level, financial level, uh, the main shortcomings or criticalities that we can raise are the interruption of funding and projects based on administrative elections outcomes. We have seen this in very different contexts. Recently, we had interviews popping out again because of, of uh, the war in Palestine about what is what has happened with uh, the local government in Afghanistan or what uh, uh, how comes that Libya now is so in instable. Of course, uh, when we have international donors, uh, they hold uh, they hold the wallet, and uh, if the this wallet is is very big, it is able in uh, through an economic lever to encourage, to favor, or or also to repress certain processes. What happened here in Palestine in 2006, we had the last election. Uh, during that last election, uh, Hamas war was um, was sorry won. And uh, but this thing was not recognized by international community. The second, uh, the second uh, time, and what happened uh, this time that uh, international uh, uh, government did not recognize uh, the government and stop the funding until another solution was found. Um, I will not enter here into, pol into political discussion, but still this is very, um, uh, it is very political and affects the ground because of course here we had subsidized projects about um, developing roads, about developing sewerage system, about uh, fixing, um, um, fixing houses, uh, rebuilding villages. So it's very important. The, the same thing has happened several times anytime we had uh, elections from uh, for uh, uh, the local administrations and municipalities. So regardless of what is our opinion, this is a fact on the ground that my funding of projects, regardless if the project is useful or not, it is good or not, can be stopped anytime by the donor for any reason. If the donor is 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 from uh, has a holds an international agenda, foreign agenda, this is very dangerous. We have an uneven distribution of funding because, of course, any donor is trying to also bring back home as many benefits as possible in a also kind of neoliberal approach. Uh, so it's not just a, a, um, a donation, a generous donation for nothing. There are also uh, revenues that are calculated. And often the local uh, local teams or the local context is the one that benefits less. Uh, and accessibility for small initiatives, especially in location in the in the south uh, of, of the Mediterranean and in, in um, uh, growing countries, uh, the most crucial part of the, the labor force and also of the creative 
um, let's say, engine of, of those countries are very small businesses that often work informally, that do not have um, a, uh, an administrative, um, let's say, working paradigm that compares or that fits um, uh, uh, the standards from international donors, especially from uh, the West, so North American countries and European countries. This means that when it when applications uh, and call for grants uh, are issued, um, the the donor often tends to um, uh, apply a certain selection uh, process that works well in their own local context. But it's uh, it's unapplicable locally for those who would really need and benefit and make this donation very uh, very fruitful. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, an increased aid dependency as also an Italian, so a European, but from the southern part of Europe. Um, we have also a history of this uh, within our own country. Uh, um, uh, the excessive intervention of, of, of subsidies also create a sort of uh, like um, um, dependency and expectation that if something is needed, someone with, will come from the top and provide uh, funding and provide something to fix it. We often hear the expression, it is because of the government. Yeah, the government does have many responsibilities, but also local communities can still do so much. Uh, seen from a perspective of projects, uh, rationales, and, and uh, the creation of, of ideas and proposals, um, the main shortcomings are the prioritization of international agendas over uh, the local needs, a reduced receptivity, receptivity of local counter proposals, which means that if um, a, an, a foreign donor comes from abroad with a pre established agenda, because within its own system, this year we have to prioritize, I don't know, green, or we have to prioritize gender, or we have to prioritize, I don't know what. Uh, if the if the local the recipient says yeah sorry but this is not really an issue here not now we have uh, more urgent um, issues to tackle or not maybe in this location but maybe you can bring this issue on another site that we feel it fits more often we have a sort of resistance from the donor to adapt its plans for several reasons uh, uh, an imposed methodology. Uh, um, this is not always something that is like um, what I'm tackling here in general is not always malicious, but sometimes it's just like a lack of of sensitivity of uh, of international agencies. So coming to bring a methodology because in in our experience, in our context, it worked very well without really questioning, yes, but uh, are we maybe available to change this methodology and ask our peers here if this is this kind of thing might be understood, might work well here locally? Uh, I could see it in, in, uh, in planning activities, for example, in the local physical planning manual that was developed on a, on a German paradigm, but it doesn't really apply to the local context for so many reasons. And nevertheless, there were funds and there were people to be engaged. There was a deadline and there was, there was this will and the thing uh, became real, but it's not really uh, applied in the field in an effective way. The selection process is also problematic uh, in terms of who we are bringing from abroad and who are we choosing as local uh, local experts. How do I measure the quality of a local expert if I am coming from abroad and know very little of a local context? Really, I think it's something, it's a kind of question that we have to pose uh, ourselves when we approach the field, okay? Um, and a reduced uh, project making attitude that is a kind of derivation of the last point that I showed in the slide before. Uh, it's uh, from the recipient, from uh, the context that is re receiving the project. There, 
there, um, there is a kind of increasing attitude year after year of uh, in making projects independently without waiting for someone to propose. Okay. Um, that time-wise, uh, the outcome, the, the the shortcomings are uh, the fact that we often deal with output-focused approaches. So, what matters in international projects is the final outcome, the building, the road, uh, the 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 rehabilitation of number uh, uh, dwelling units. I don't know. Um, and then also short-term horizon, international projects uh, tend to stay within five to two years time, time uh, length, which, for example, if we, talk, if we even think about um, um, strategic development or planning, urban planning, uh, five years are really nothing. Um, so uh, the time horizon in international projects in general is, is um, uh, underperforming certain kind of projects, not all, but some of them, and something to take into consideration. The lack of a follow-up because of this short timeline and because uh, of the output-focused attitude, uh, there is often, most of the times, there is not a follow-up phase, a long one, to see what happens with the project, and there is not a kind of revisional, a revision phase in which, uh, after seeing how the project ended up after a few years to see if there is something we can do to recalibrate and to readdress uh, the project if, if, it, if it was not working uh, as expected uh, or if conditions on, on the ground has changed so much that made this project absolutely not functioning. Finally, uh, the donor's budget time, plans timing uh, uh, exceeds and the kind of rules what happens with the project which means as a, a very basic European based example, that if let's say one agency, one state or, or the European Union, each year they have a financial program, okay, and they establish funding for this and, and that other thing. And there is also a deadline for spending those money in research, uh, I, I'm saying this also from an Italian perspective. We receive funding from the EU for developing research uh, research lines, and sometimes, yeah, we didn't do anything in, the, in this five years, and we end up uh, having just two years. What do we do? Okay, we we find a project. Let's we have like eighty millions to spend. Let's do something. It's something, unfortunately quite common to witness. From a cultural perspective, there is a cultural prevalence from the donor uh, in the way projects are written, in the way concepts and procedures are preferred or applied uh, and not giving as, as much space to locally produced concept, okay? Same as for methodologies and also in the way the everyday working activities and the, the working relationships are are uh, are made uh, the 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 etiquette in the in in the office and outside the office, and finally a culturally super, superficial approach also to the local context, not being really able for uh, uh, operators working in sites to understand, not being ve very well prepared and aware aware about certain kinds of ways of thinking etiquettes way of to, to speak with people um, there is even a way of like the same idea conveyed in a in a way that is called is it is decontextualized in terms of language that is how we we build even a sentence i may speak arabic for example and working in working in an arabic place but if for example i greet my my guests in Morocco saying I am saying something very bad. I'm saying go to hell. It's Arabic, it's standard Arabic, but locally it's understood this way. It happened to me. Uh, but here in the Levant instead instead is a in, is a sentence of appreciation. So you see, like it's it's a very it's a very sensitive work that we have to be at least aware of. Okay. Understand maybe okay, sorry, I do not have enough. Uh, of this kind of competences, this is why I'm going to take more 
from the field and take into more uh, local local feedback. Finally, there is a scrutiny uh, about how we do things. If uh, donors are able, have the power uh, through contributions uh, to steer contents and adapt narratives how through uh, controlling how we write reports and how we publish. Reports um, are more for projects. Publications uh, maybe concern more the way we read, we write in, a, in, in the academic context, but still there is much an, an, um, an attentiveness in do, do not use this word uh, and there is a constant review of the kind of, of, uh, of uh, terms that we use. Um, uh, in our way of writing, uh, funding selection criteria, also like screening the past of applicants, for example. This is very much true for anyone from the Middle East, uh, the M Middle Eastern area, especially since uh, um, uh, uh, the 9-11, uh, and also the contextualized terms and conditions in funding. So what happens to us, for example, as Yalla, is that uh, we won a grant, uh, a very small one, but to get that grant, we had to sign a contract. Anyone who wins a grant has to sign an agreement. But one of, of the terms and condition in the agreement was stating something about, uh, for example, political activities that makes completely very well sense. In, in the UK, it was a UK grant, but applied on here, I would be kind of forced of dismissing most of my employees because they were uh, part of the Palestinian resistance. And in that way, like a certain way of using certain terms, would apply locally in a way that is very discriminatory. It's very important that at least we understand this. Okay, so um, okay, so um, I'm going now to talk about then what to do. What what are we doing? How do we respond to all this? Uh, we in, in our title we spoke about an emancipatory practice, uh, an, an intention uh, to decolonize our pro uh, our processes and to find a paradigm that uh, is is fairer to the local context that it, and that is decentralized. How we do that? Uh, it's uh, a critique is not sufficient. There must be something afterwards. We need to propose something if we are criticizing all this. Okay, but then what we do afterwards? So what we are trying to do here since, uh, since uh, uh, 2018 is exactly this. Let's find a way to do it differently. Is it possible to do that? This is our, our context, the city of Nablus, where we established our um, uh, Project Zero. This is our location on the city. And here you have... a kind of like few basic data about the city of Nablus. It's a very ancient city. It's uh, uh, the first settlement here was uh, uh, dates back from the uh, biblical period as Shechem. Uh, and uh, now it has reached uh, uh, 200,000 and more population estimated. So it's quite a uh, Quite a big city for for um, for the Middle East uh, in a comparative way, and here you can see the built tissue uh, where we are uh, contextualized, and you see uh, where we are exactly uh, with the with the yellow uh, with the yellow sign. Okay, so uh, just to give a very brief historical background, um, Nablus was was a core site uh, within the colonial project of Israel, especially since 1967. So uh, we are one of the most important target areas in the West Bank and after Gaza, uh, uh, one of the main uh, uh, of the main location for uh, battles uh, together with the, the city of Jenin. Uh, so uh, the city of Nablus has endured a very long siege, a seven-year siege that particularly sealed out 
the Kasbah, so the historical city, from the rest of uh, um, of its surrounding context, and and anyhow, the city of Nablus is um, um, uh, was also very much. Uh, contained and uh, and strangulated by the occupation as you could see from the map uh, perhaps it's uh, it is uh, understandable we are laying in the in a valley bottom a long valley bottom so we only have two entrances one one from one side of the city and from, one from the other side and a few hikes on the mountains, all of those entrances and exits uh, are under the Israeli control. So, for example, as I said, it's one month and a half that we are not able to go out unless we go under the, the check of, uh, uh, of military personnel, Israeli military personnel. Since 2001, uh, the siege has started and was lifted in 2007. You can imagine uh, fencing out an entire community, an entire old town. It's like saying the um, uh, Brussels Pentagon being unreachable for seven years and who is in is in and who is out is out. So you can imagine also the, the uh, withdrawal from uh, let's say being completely disconnected with what happens with the rest of the world, uh, not uh, keeping up with, uh, with changes, uh, not having um, uh, an exchange with, uh, uh, with uh, other populations and other cultures. So uh, it, it, it really affects a lot. Okay, uh, since 2001, uh, we are experiencing more frequently raids and armed attacks uh, from uh, the Israeli army uh, since the, uh, the beginning of the new Netanyahu administration. It was, um, uh, we really felt uh, an effect. And here you can see we are a continuous battlefield. So even before uh, the war um, started in, in the 7th of, 7th of October, as I said, since since 2001, we are experiencing, we are again, uh, the Casb of Nablus, um, uh, 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 primary targets of uh, uh, the Israeli uh, army uh, arm, armed campaign. And also, it is a focus, uh, it is a location of the local resistance. So here you can see a few titles of the last months. Uh, uh, we have uh, armed, uh, like paramilitary groups uh, that also are uh, using the uh, the Kasbah of Nablus and its very thick uh, urban and social tissue, uh, it is a uh, it's a kind of a fortress to try to organize um, a, a counteroffensive um, against Israel. So here it is, for example, a footage from. Uh, um, uh, August uh, 2022, and here we had it's uh, it's in the, our same neighbor, uh, in, uh, in our same na neighborhood, uh, we have uh, uh, military rights. What does it mean? The seven years like this that we are witnessing what Nurhan Abujdi, in particularly, has uh, uh, substantiated as herbicide. What is this? It is a way to strangulate and to suffocate the local content and culturally and socially. How? There were different ways. Uh, there, were, there were sieges, the long curfews. Here, for example, the city of Nablus underwent 90 years of curfews with only 30 minutes uh, to go out from the house and find something to eat for some. You can imagine if you have also kids or if you need to work, how are you going to sustain yourself? Military raids, in several parts of the city and uh, uh, several kinds of invasion. Here, contextualized in our very site, we have three kinds of scenarios that we uh, witnessed and somehow we still witness. It's urban warfare with a bit like typical war scenario, but also we had um, a walking through walls uh, uh, activity that is instead of uh, like um, uh, the Israeli army, instead of passing through the alleys that are um, too dangerous because they would be um, exposed to uh, uh, attacks from uh, defensive attacks from the local population. They instead use houses 
to and dig through from a house to another in a way that especially Eyal Weizmann has very well studied and published a lot on it. And also the, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the invasion of, uh, of uh, civil houses. I see that someone is raising a hand, uh, Noor, but I don't know if it's maybe, maybe we leave um, uh, questions at the end, if it's okay with you. So this is just a, a, a um, uh, zoom in on what it means herbicide. This guy was a carpenter and he just made enough money after a few years uh, of a sustain, like let's say sustainable life somehow, more stable. Uh, uh, this guy I was uh, was killed in uh, 2022, and this is the kind of scenario. So even ancient houses that were uh, reappropriated and and uh, restored by local inhabitants then get destroyed again. So the herbicide um, uh, uh, partial destruction through different level. Uh, of displacement as well. One kind of displacement con uh, concerns mainly uh, the local families and the local communities fleeing the place um, because it's unsustainable to stay there. You can imagine if you have a child and uh, one of our employees had this problem. And a few months ago, he just had a baby and then we had Israeli rights very close to his house and he was desperate to find another place where to, to bring his wife and and uh, and uh, his daughter uh, who was just three months old. Also this means that if the location is not safe um, also it's the worst place where you could have businesses so you have any kind of business trying to find another location or just going out of business so uh, what um, what produced here in our case study in our project site is that 60% of buildings are de derelicted or ruined or squatted illegally by people that at a certain point searching searching a house in, in town and their poverty level is very high and they find derelict houses they just settle in and then it's very difficult to to have them going out again uh, to leave the place. 60% of um, in the city, in the old town of, of Nablo, 60% of the local workforce is unemployed or is working very occasionally with a very low income level. This kind of percentage is way lower outside uh, our side, outside Nablus Kasbah. Also, um, there is uh, unstable living conditions and also, years and years of these conditions produce an entrenchment, produce a, a, a defensiveness, an elevated defensiveness and closure of the local community, a high level of suspiciousness, for example. Herbicide, this is all part of herbicide, and here are summarized um, the main effects of uh, eventually of the herbicide that we are witnessing here. So abandoning uh, buildings in a very historically um, layered uh, site, shrinking and fragmenting uh, of uh, the society, uh, uh, the creation of many Economic boundaries, um, uh, uh, territorial boundaries as well. So, like uh, the, the circulation can be blocked anytime. Uh, cultural boundaries, as I said, uh, so cultural entrenchment and also being cut off from the local community means, uh, uh, let's say, staying behind with the changes and also. Also, having producing a very negative image of the local context uh, as a place um, that is um, insecure, that is risky, that is aggressive, and this kind of negative image is not only for the foreigners but also for the very locals. So, most of people that we met since 2018 initially had an idea um, uh, about the uh, uh, the Nablus Kasbah as a place where not go because anything can happen anytime, because it's just a place for paramilitary people and poverty and desperate people. And if you want to enjoy life, you go in uh, uh, in one of the of, of the neighborhoods where you have uh, uh, international cafes and, uh, and expensive places, of course, if you have money. But if you don't, uh, you don't participate in the life of the city. So what are we doing with all this? 
question, is it possible to find an alternative way of working in crisis contexts and be together all around sustainable, independent from external aids, so we can decide what to do according to local priorities and not someone else coming and telling us what to do uh, and when. Fair to the site and its inhabitants. So instead of taking advantage of, I do a very nice project as, a, as a, even a local architect. I do a very nice project on the site and then I get published and I become fixed. And then maybe I get a better, uh, a better income, but the local context is not so important if actually after I published my nice paper or a few pictures or I made my exhibition at the local site and the local people will see me go, I'm done. And also relevant to other contexts, despite being strongly site-based. What are we doing? What, what we are doing can be useful for someone else also beyond Palestine. What, how to split this, to answer those questions with a vision. So this is, this vision encapsulates the state of the art when we started working. And this resentencing is instead what we wanted to achieve through our projects on Nablus, that is our project zero. Okay, so instead of being an, a place for an urban guerrilla and a marginalized, derelict place to become something that is safe, welcoming, vibrant, again, sustainable. Okay, so let's be practical to do that. Uh, we said that we need to stay independent from external interferences. Uh, first of all, we need to seek for a financial ind independency and a sustainability, okay? So um, we need to stay, to be self-funded, this means. And uh, we, w this means also that, not that we are going to refuse uh, any kind uh, of uh, external, uh, of, of any kind of grants or donation, but is that we do not need to do that. We are not in need to um, uh, collect here and there grants our words and something to stay alive, to, to operate. Maybe you operate on a small, on a, um, let's say, slower pace, but we can still do that. And the 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 initiative um, can work on its, uh, stand on its own legs, okay? And also uh, financial sustainability serves to preserve our freedom of choice and also uh, core to our way of working is to keep an eye on how much we are uh, inclusive in terms of economic um, uh, accessibility of what we are doing from uh, spatial projects to the price of our coffee. Okay, uh, so economic boundaries are one of the strongest boundaries that we can find in projects. How we do that? We have two containers. One, we created is a uh, uh, research and design environment that we call it Al Marsam, that is tra uh, translated is the lab, that is our think tank and design and research environment. And on the other hand, we have a social enterprise, Yalla Mishwar, that is currently working through three um, social businesses, um, a social cafe, uh, a guest house, and Mishwar, that is uh, an, uh, an agency that is organizing cultural events. Uh, second working principle, we work as a collective. I already said it as one of our overarching principles, but here it's, uh, it's particularly, proves particularly important to join forces, to create a momentum, to join people uh, towards a same aim of improving local living condition, to catalyze and support initiatives in the city, right to overcome that kind of immobility that we are experiencing here of waiting for someone from outside to bring money and bring a project to fix life and it never works eventually and also to work as peers with uh, within the local context we are uh, uh, what is really important to avoid the, the kind of um, again patronizing um, approach of being there as the experts, as the deus ex machina that is coming from outside, bringing solutions. Uh, we have to be part of, of, the pro of the process and not uh, those who make and end the, pro the process. How, again, to do that? It's to work 
in the site every day on a daily basis and being hands-on. So uh, we operate as part of the local community. The fact that we are working instead of a, as an office, as a cafe and has a guest house uh, allows us to be within the local community and to partake and to be part of the local desk in terms of everything because when we build social relationship we have an everyday exchange with our neighbors uh, we also join the um, economic tissue so whatever goes brings down the local uh, the local conditions will bring also us down whatever improves the place is going to to experience it firsthand we are going really to see it in how many people can pay for a coffee how many people are visiting today how many days we are not really working how and all this kind of very very uh, grounded and empirical ways of feeling the place and being part of the place um, and also again the office less part is very important we do not willingly we do not have an office there is not the kind of uh, let's say uh, practice on having to knock at our door and uh, find us at a desk with our with our computers with our maybe a map on the wall uh, uh, here you see a, a map on the wall on my back just because I'm 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 talking from home and not from from the side okay so it is also this kind of of spatial boundary of feeling of going to an office to ask for uh, the consultancy from someone who is expert but we are just part of of the place and we are experimenting at the same level of of uh, um, our local peers um, to work in such an unstable approach requires something that is very much lacking in international project that is a, a tactical and flexible way of doing things. We need to establish clearly long-run objectives. Uh, Yalla project actually, we, it took us since 2013 to create, to think about what to do. But then, to, and we started working five years after, so now we are 10 years from the beginning of the idea of Yellow Project. And uh, we have to combine this long run clear objective with a short run tactical action to and be able to reroute, be prepared to have a, a plan A, B, C, D, A, and also to cultivate resiliency. Very important is incrementality. This works well uh, on both the economic level and also the social impact. Incrementality means that, of course, although two of my partners are from Nablus, they are not from the old town. And it, this alone makes a difference of not being from the old town. So it's a way to say, let's go easy with the place. Let's go gentle with the place and respect the place. So we start small in a um, in a strategically valuable place that we can also afford without exposing the project to high economic risks so um uh, we have uh, we started with a very small bu budget and then we started building and renovating in a very simple way our first space uh, a couple of rooms in our social cafe uh, with makeshift and do-it-yourself uh, um, um, uh, spatial choices, okay, um, but very well studied, very well uh, researched how through social media, by staying in the place without doing much for quite a while, okay. The running costs and this kind of social businesses, meanwhile, pos position us as uh, as people with a function within the local context, within the local community, and it's also creating a small income. This income is put back in circle to upgrade the existing and build something new. Okay, so, um, and eventually we reached uh, to renovate uh, an uh, entire residential complex this way. I will tell you later. Uh, 
and then going um, uh, going more uh, let's say specialized uh, we are pursuing uh, and we are working through um, an acupunctural approach uh, to flows and spaces as we said we start small uh, but small but in very impactful as impactful as possible so part of those five preparatory years that i said where to scout a place and to understand where we would have higher possibilities to succeed and to in activating and renovating and revitalizing the place the the, the context that we aim to tackle so here are our where we are positioned in the field and uh, five years ago we uh, sensed uh, we could predict these two flows the blue one are uh, students coming from the local campus um, and going to the main transportation hub to go back home uh, and uh, the red one are uh, uh, potential visitors local tourists uh, palestinian tourists tourists from uh, the arab israeli villages uh, and uh, also international tourists these two flows were not existing when we started. Then we uh, we um, um, put an effort uh, in detecting uh, local levers, both on uh, the spatial and uh, um, on the social um, on the social side. Okay, how to combine uh, in the best way social, uh, let's say, um, uh, potentials from the local community as people and potential from the local side as spaces. The social part takes the most of our activity. And as I uh, anticipated a little bit before, uh, there is a lot of observation and staying there without doing something, uh, let's say, uh, really uh, visible or very like impactful on the site, but just to know the place and to keep knowing the place. Uh, it's very important to cultivate a, a process oriented um, uh, attitude also in this, in, in, in this sense, to understand that communities change constantly. And when you bring something new, it will reshuffle the community and it will reshuffle how spaces are used, okay? So it is a constant way of doing something and then observing, listening, watching, and then doing something more alone, in partnership. What happens if I do something with this person, with this group? What are the outcomes? So the the, um, uh, the part dedicated to, to the understanding and to staying and, and to connecting with the local society is really, I would say, 60 to 70% of our work. Um, and here I kind of summarized uh, basically uh, uh, the sequence of things that, uh, that we do and we continue redoing all, all the time. We um, eventually reach uh, the possibility of synthesizing the local geographies, the groups that inhabit the place, where they are, what is their role, what is their relationship, how is, uh, instead of, 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 um, uh, of uh, this grid, I think next time I'm going to propose a constellation. And it's a, again, it's a mobile constellation. It continuously changes. Uh, as architects, I think our standard education is it does not help us and accepting things even buildings as something that move con constantly and instead i think we have to embrace this uh, it's way more fruitful it's way easier actually once you get a little bit the math how it works it's so much easier uh, part of this interaction with the with the local society is acknowledging. It's very important this work acknowledging uh, local key roles and integrating them as part of the project, as uh, in title of. Once we understand who are key roles in the place, also the project changes and its trajectory also changes. We have seen, especially in international projects, how very good ideas fail because they do not, uh, let's say, modify or, or fit into the local social geography. So uh, it's, it neglects 
core um, uh, figures that are either community, but also key people like the gatekeeper. You can see here, we use the sketch. We have in, in our site, this five kinds of very important people that really uh, uh, proved crucial uh, in uh, protecting, supporting, and continuing our activities even far beyond our expectations sometimes. Uh, but it took us a lot of, of trial and error. So it's uh, you will see at the end, it's not all uh, everything smooth and goes linearly, okay? So when we go back to the idea of cross-reading the space, uh, the spatial scale and society, it also means to really try to make an effort in understanding and sometimes as architects, we are also good at, at, at describing them graphically, that is so intuitive. How do we connect? What is the position of people once they are in the house, what is their condition? When, once they are in the house, what, what do they do? What is their role? What is their position? And then when we look at them in their role and condition at a more architectural scale within the same building, what happens to them? When they are part of the local community, the neighbors, and when they are part of the urban community, what happens to them? Can this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, relationship, changing relationship across scales help us um, uh, in our project and in, in achieving something for the place. Part of uh, our observation on communities is not just this kind of like very much social sciences apparently thing, but it's very much about understanding imaginaries uh, in the local, uh, on uh, Im imaginaries existing on the place where we work. In our experience, in our um, case zero in Nablus Kasba, there were so many imaginaries ex already existing in the place, good and bad. That I already said, many people used to think that um, uh, the site uh, was ruined and creepy and uh, scary, but also there was so much of a nostalgia, so much of a longing for uh, the beauty, the lost beauty of the Kasbah and how especially elderly people remembered, but also young people we are longing to experience because whatever is outside the, the Nablus Kasbah mostly was built uh, between the 70s and the, two, the 2000s in a way that is still problematic in terms of life quality. So also inspired by the exposure to um, um, TV series, uh, and uh, social media, uh, also new generations were longing for having also for themselves here in the city of Nablus, one of uh, this kind of, to enjoy the uh, the dimension uh, of uh, the, the very long Palestinian history. So what we did uh, eventually was to study all this and to understand all this and to uh, arrive to a very, very fine-grained understanding which kind of materials uh, is made this, uh, this dream of, which kind of colors do have these imaginaries have. There are like historical colors uh, that are um, in our site showed up to be uh, kind of um, uh, archetypical for local communities in Palestine. There is the turquoise. Uh, we even called uh, the guest house turquoise just to trigger that in imaginaries. Uh, that was, uh, let's say, it, it's not casual. It's very significant. So here we went really into the semiotics of space, the semiotics of uh, space, the existing one, and and semiotics of space of of possible future uh, future spaces that accommodate those expectations and dreams. Here it is how to, ex to explain a little bit how it started on the left and how uh, it became little by little. Now this room that you see has become a kitchen, has become the kitchen of uh, our rooftop uh, cafe. Uh, but uh, so it, we all constantly change it to see also in terms of um, it's changed according to also how the local community is changing. When we took this picture, 
it was not possible to imagine to open our rooftop to the public, to anyone. And uh, and now, nevertheless, despite the last one year of uh, recurring attacks, it became obvious. It, it, it came from within the local community. Please open your rooftop publicly. Make a, co a coffee shop there. Make an uh, make a roof garden because we we would like to have something like this. So this became a kitchen. Uh, the same is for um, our uh, uh, cafe um, uh, on the on the street. So here you can see how it started. Uh, the very first day we started uh, putting our hands in. Uh, it was a, uh, previously a cafe, but with a very bad story in the, in the back. We even uh, crossed our path with uh, 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 drug dealers prostitution, local mafias. So uh, by working in the field and taking time to be in the field, you also discover all the, let's say, informal network of power, the dark side, let's say, of, uh, of society that nevertheless exists. So you, at least you have to know that, okay? And, to, uh, and, and we activated it and we con continuously reshuffle even uh, furnitures uh, according to how people are using it. So, for example, you can see in one of the pictures, you can maybe spot that there is a difference between the, the, the spatial layout of this very room in the video and in the picture above. Uh, in the picture above, you can see that there is a, um, a table near to um, the, the window on the street. We had to move it at a certain point because it had, uh, in a certain moment, uh, local conditions made that table the location for uh, a bunch of, of guys uh, in the neighborhood for uh, peeping and looking at girls uh, uh, walking in the street. And this was very intimidating for, for girls. And uh, so we ended up finding that our coffee shop was full of guys uh, that had not very much interest, but in uh, looking at girls, and so even uh, that uh, the flow of, of students that are here are mainly girls students in uh, universities here have a majority of uh, of female uh, students started not coming and started avoiding passing in front of us. So going back to a route that was com completely bypassing our neighbor. Once we remove that table. And we worked a little bit on, on social activities, uh, free activities. We again reversed and we came back having a majority of female, uh, female customers. Uh, here it is one of the space of our uh, guest house. Uh, when we entered it, it was an abandoned uh, uh, merchant house dating back to uh, the 17th uh, century. Um, and uh, it was, as you can see, it, a part of it had no roof because it was uh, bombed during the 2001 siege. Uh, so uh, the family uh, that were living in this house fled. And, and went out of uh, of Nablus Kasbah. They still had the house, but they were not absolutely considering coming back to live here. So we took over it. No one, no one of our spaces actually is owned. We didn't buy any of those spaces. We are leasing them. We are renting them. And one day they are going to to go back to its owners. Uh, how you here you can see how also the adaptation the, the uh, ephemeral adaptation very short temporary changes of layout allowed us to uh, not only transform this place as a guest house so a place where we could really host not only the local community but to favor also the encounter with foreigners in a protected way. Uh, but here you can see it has become also a place for um, rented for uh, uh, thesis debate, for example, graduation projects and stuff. Uh, here it is our rooftop, how it was when we when it started. And as I said, it's a continuous changing, shifting, trying. We had on um, here, for example, you can see a picture of uh, um, uh, 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 a wedding. A couple came during COVID. They had no place where they could even have a have a small wedding and they asked for our space to try it and it was uh, very uh, uh, very nice here the same rooftop 
especially our rooftop proved to be very open to so many different interpretations. We are now using also as a biofarm and um, we started um, collaboration with someone who was um, uh, our um, uh, chief, the chief of, uh, of uh, uh, the, um, um, uh, the workers that uh, made heavy uh, restoration works, uh, etc. This person who has a past also so as, um, as a gunman, uh, was trying to find another destiny for himself, but also for his daughter, who, who is studying business and he wanted to find another life. So and now he has become one of our partners that we are handing in part of our activity. And he has uh, opened his own restaurant on our rooftop. Uh, also, we are making space this way to many different occasions for different uh, uh, um, practices of active uh, citizenship. One of this uh, of this picture, uh, the one on the left, is showing you uh, an occasional lunch between our some of our um, uh, volunteers coming from abroad. Here you have a sitting at the table: Canada, UK, the Netherlands, Palestine, etc. Um, but also uh, free cultural events, a traditional cultural events that is Hakawati, that is like a storytelling, a very traditional thing, but that was sung by uh, a woman. Uh, coming from Jordan, fantastic, fantastic event, uh, and also city hiking. So to open again in a in a gentle way, a gradual um, uh, way, um, uh, the space of the city around us, uh, also coping with crisis. What is happening? The adaptation that we went through is for here. I symbolize what we are. Uh, testing with two pictures. One is June 2003 during um, uh, one of the major Israeli invasion, invasion in the city. You can see the, the smoke in the back of, uh, of the people on of our rooftop and the person who is writing uh, the uh, on the la on the laptop is a journalist. We had several journalists and local guests that were witnessing and reporting from our rooftop. This is also what we are doing now. In this very moment, we have three journalists in our guest house that is not really working because now the city is closed. But somehow uh, we had a reputation now of a safe place welcoming and supporting uh, uh, the local community and, and, commu and temporary community uh, going through the space. So it became a journalist outlet covering the war from the West Bank. And here you have another um, uh, another picture uh, it was the beginning of the lockdown, uh, of the COVID lockdown. It, our cafe was closed for nine months, but we became, until it was possible, we, the outlet where uh, food aids for the local communities uh, uh, was uh, collected and distributed together with the local community. It was an initiative of the local community asking us to open our cafe to prepare food and distribute it. Uh, again, in practice, people and space is unlocking community potentials. There is a little bit the stereotype, I have to say, uh, on the Middle East that ladies do not have space or do not have initiative. I never found a place like Palestine so full of women entrepreneurs. As an Italian, it was a little bit shocking because here every woman has a small business, anything. It, it's, it's very inventive. Uh, but we could open the space of the old town that was socially entrenched and kind of like reluctant to uh, leave the floor to women to instead open up to this opportunity, uh, especially the the lady that you see serving uh, a tray with a tray serving a, a breakfast. This is our neighbor. Uh, she had no business before, Muna, and now she is uh, our stable provider at the ground floor. We decided not to have a chef. We tried for a while, and then we decided that Muna is going to cook for us. And because she is our neighbor, uh, she asked us for uh, uh, our opinion. How sh how can I also make my ground floor part of your of your coffee shop? She this this one you can see below her picture. It is her own ground floor. It is not antique. Uh, we didn't put our brand, but we just said, okay, 
you, we put a, a couple of lighting. If you don't know how to do that, we can bring you something to do that. And uh, let's make an agreement. You cook together both for us and uh, and for you. You have Muna Cafe, and then we encourage our to have a swap uh, of our um, our customers. So for her, of course, it meant uh, uh, financial improvement and also uh, realizing herself. She's fantastic. Also to measure inclusiveness for us means to open to in a safe way to use it that were not um, thinkable before. And to do that for people that didn't have a space. Here you can see a picture of uh, a yoga session on rooftop. You can imagine in a place that is socially entrenched and it is not used at seeing people stretching in their, uh, in their shorts. It was quite an achievement to have people liking it. Uh, it didn't come uh, all of a sudden. We worked a lot on it, on it, but still now we have also opening sport culture, uh, bringing it back in the in the local context. You can see that we have also uh, girls scouts. We have also praying sessions. Uh, in our um, uh, vegetable garden, actually, so that was a kind of uh, uh, event for uh, for girls, uh, and to open such a public space uh, in a safe way to uh, uh, even um, let's say religious or meditative activities for different kinds of community. That's very important. Um, and uh, finally, as I said, just try to keep consistent. We I said about uh, spoke about the critique on feedback. One of the things that we can really exploit without spending a penny, uh, and we really didn't spend a penny on that, is to work a lot on social media of different types that also offer us uh, some good statistics. If you go in, uh, for example, on it and know a lot about who's your audience and to use them to interact with a certain parts of society. So here it is a screenshot on uh, how we use social medias to have a feedback and to listen from um, people that follow us through the social media. Of course, social media are not solving everything because uh, if we go again uh, on uh, social media analysis, we can see that a huge part of the population in terms of age is not represented. So we have to use different, integrate different manners, but it was very effective. So to wrap up the first, the last three minutes, how did it go? Five years. Uh, let's try to put it in numbers, in, um, in very worldly numbers. These are, uh, the achievement that we could measure. So we have new uh, new nine business in our neighbor. You can see them mapped and also you can see a, a little bit of the, their sequence. Of course, in 2022, 23, we do not have so many new things happening because of, um, of the sieges and the continuous warfare that we had, but nevertheless, few months ago also we had a new business with a, a big investment from a family the one you can see restaurant and housing top left that's uh, it was a family and a prominent family that uh, uh, that owns a big cluster in, in our neighbor and that fled uh, the neighborhood in 2001 and now they decided not only to live again there but also to open a quite a huge business 15 existing businesses were supported, so that they were dormant and they found new vital vibrance, the possibility to uh, uh, open again or upgrade their activities, which means also uh, new, like new blood to the local uh, economy. And four uh, women-led businesses created, four local housing renovations that we helped indirectly uh, 13 job positions uh, just within within yalla uh, but actually uh, yeah we started as three people and now we are more than 13 now we have two new and beyond 60 uh, between volunteers researchers and trainees who joined us which means what does it mean 60 people why do we care for it in a place that uh, was completely set apart from the rest of the world to uh, to achieve such a number of foreigners staying for months 
and living in our guest house. So seeing our neighbors every time was quite something. It was not thinkable when we started. Uh, our initial budget was 5,400 euros with which we started the renovation of the cafe. Uh, our uh, incremental activity brought us to a uh, total investment between uh, money and in-kind investment uh, of 50,000 euros more, so 10 times more. But also there is uh, um, at least three, we calculated, we estimated more than 3 million euros investments uh, sprawled across properties through this regeneration and new activities, new jobs, new renovations, new shops. Uh, more than 30 job positions were created uh, across the neighborhood and we could endure one pandemic and one year of Israeli campaigns in our neighbor and also an almost complete closure uh, since uh, the 7th of October. This is our road uh, before we started working. And this is our neighbor on the right, how it looks like now. What you see in the street, we did nothing of it. This doesn't belong to us. This is the street uh, uh, at the corner with us. Uh, there were shops opened. As, uh, some spaces changed their, uh, uh, their use and became um, boutique and became um, uh, bakeries and before they were just storages and all the things that you see, the lighting, the plants, look at even like the color of, of um, uh, the, the door and the color of some of the buckets, they are turquoise, because of course it has a meaning, not because of us, but just because we found something that was next, that meant something for the place already. We just brought it back. So this is how our neighbors, little by little, each of them added something. All good. Happy ever after. It was easy uh, and um, uh, all uh, rainbows and butterflies. No, let's be honest. So um, we have to also reflect on how much it was difficult in this five years project uh, that feels like 15 years uh, to have no brand in a colonial context where you have so many like the presence, a long-term colonial presence also mean a lot of double agents, a lot of recruitment of Palestinians in many, many different ways to affiliate to different agendas, to Israeli agendas, to local mafias, to no, no, no. So it's a, it's a very wild context. It's very wild. Um, so to come there without a brand, without just, just a family name, uh, we had at the back, the family name of, uh, of Abdurrahman and Basad. That was a little bit known, but that, that was it. It was not enough. We were putting our feet in a very thick uh, power network full of, of people and everyone wanted something, something different. And we were steering that uh, that environment by changing things even gently so we went through uh, and we are now still now going through a continuous scrutiny we are constantly surveilled what we do how we spend money so we are, have to keep track of everything be extremely attentive a few times, uh, Basel, who is uh, also our field coordinator and he's on the front line every single day, was detained once by the Israeli army and once by the Palestinian authority, because all of them were saying it's impossible that you are working, that everyone is sinking and instead you are still working and we, you, we can't find a trace that you have money. Either you have money from, the Israelis were saying you have money from uh, the, uh, some of the Palestinian uh, militia. So you're maybe whitewashing, you're, you're uh, making money laundry of, of uh, money that goes for weapon. The Palestinian Authority was also trying to understand if we were money laundering and we had to bring bills and they were not really believing the maths. Or on the other side, we had uh, also, like also the Palestinian Authority was saying, if, you, if you're 
able to work this way, it means that you're getting money from Israel, so that, that you are spies. So you can imagine how difficult it is. We also, as I said, we are also working in an entrenched, entrenched context, which means that building trust is difficult and that that trust is easy to be broken. And so it exposes us to having no one at, at, in our back in a very socially, um, let's say, compact uh, framework. Um, it exposes us to, uh, let's say, inaccurate narratives or like uh, uh, narratives that try to push in something bad about us or gossiping, I would say. Uh, for many different re reasons. Uh, also, there are project drawbacks. Our our trajectory is not all going up. It was going up, going very much down, going under the, the, the earth, and then coming up again. Uh, and also, it, it really needs a lot of patience and also narrow financial financial mar margins need, means that uh, we need more time that if there is a if there is a crisis we suffer more uh, and that sometimes we have to uh, postpone or even cancel some of uh, of our expectations but the bright side we really want to look at the bright side of uh, of life uh, is that on on the other hand, we had also a community building that showed up through crisis. We could see how strong it was because in the moment that we had uh, Basel coming back from being in uh, in the detention unit for investigation and say, okay, guys, I cannot continue. And he was telling to the neighbors, I'm maybe we dropped the project. They were the first to say, no, 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 you can't go now. You do, if you go, we, didn't, we, we really lose something. So we were not expecting to have even this kind of, of support and mobilization to solve problems. Um, so it was also very important to show weaknesses, to show that we had down moments. Uh, hand in process uh, has started since uh, June. So um, um, now, as I also uh, said a little bit before, uh, we are starting the process of being less on the front side and uh, uh, handing in part of our businesses to um, the local community, to different actors in the local community who are entering the management, they are changing, of course, what we are doing in their own way, the way they like it, that's completely fine. Uh, a successful timeline, despite all the drawbacks, we could stay within the five years classical um, uh, startup uh, period uh, and uh, uh, we started uh, the, the the phase of receiving revenues, so covering all uh, the expenses and receiving revenues, uh, and also that uh, we could prove that despite everything, we went through three major crises and we are still here. So I think it's a good proof to say that this kind of paradigm worked well in sense of sustainability. So I think that I hope this kind of uh, reflections also will be proof uh, useful to any one of you who wants to do things uh, in uh, his or her own uh, context. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you very much, Alessandra. And no doubt it, would, it will be uh, useful to, uh, to um, hopefully to, to many of them. Um, thank you very much for your amazing presentation and, and super interesting. Um, I have myself a lot of questions, as they already know it's everything like this, but I will uh, open the, the discussion to um, uh, the students and maybe um, you can either um, write your questions on the, on the chat or um, raise up your hand like uh, Noor. So please, uh, Noor, if you would like to, um, if you're still there, your hand is still there, so. Uh... Noor, was it intentional? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Anyone?
I think they, I, I uh, killed everyone. No, I don't think so. They just, <laughs> I would, so maybe just, um, I will, I will, um, uh, just share, share a, a, a question, which is also maybe a, a reflection. Uh, looking at the uh, one of the last maps you showed us with all the, let's say, um, results of your activities in the neighborhood with those many activities um, that started um, um, linked to your, your um, work. I was wondering uh, whether... Um, are you afraid um, somehow of like um, filtering up processes um, or uh, not to say uh, gentrification processes, because I think uh, this is a very specific term and I don't really like to apply this uh, at every different con to, to every different context. But let's say, um, did, you, did, you, did you think or do you think that some somehow somewhere um, uh, all these um, activities and all this, this regeneration you are bringing to the to the to the neighborhood with all these people uh, joining um, and and also participating in in very different and also spontaneous way um, will lead to a kind of land value uh, increasement and yeah that that map exactly mm -hmm. um, or on the contrary uh, all this. Um, I mean, the sense of belong, belonging of people uh, to the neighborhood will, in any case, um, uh, prevent um, this kind of, of let's say, um, uh, processes. Um, or, uh, but maybe there are other answers, uh, the constant um, crisis and insecurity of the context will, in any case, um, prevent, uh, prevent uh, like let's say gentrification processes, but just to to you know to to uh, explain or it's free to use I'm... gentrification process because it's it, it applies it okay, applies okay, to, okay. to the context yeah okay. definitely yeah uh, uh, thank you this is a, a very compelling question because uh, definitely anyone who works in uh, in this kind of of like in marginalized context and in in urban revitalization has to face this kind of uh, uh, of problem and this kind of risk. Indeed, we noticed uh, that uh, there were some attempts. Uh, for example, the Turkish bath that was uh, 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 that was uh, uh, opened by renovating part of the same building where we are uh, came from um, a non-local person. I mean, non-local as um, Son who is a local entrepreneur in the city of Nablus, but he is a kind of multimillionaire and he had a lot of money to spend. So that was really for us also um, very important to see how this thing went uh, as it, they were on the, at the ground floor of our of our building. Uh, it was important to see also how people reacted. So here, indeed, the entrenchment. Uh, the entrenchment of communities also has something can be has also a let's say a component that is instead social cohesion. So, uh, like the social cohesion is also a way that uh, is something is a lever uh, that we have to consider when we work in any context to see if this can be uh, beneficial or to which to which point and how this can be beneficial or this can be detrimental to to the place what we could notice is that definitely um there was an assessment uh, that we had to do on the ground on the kind of um, uh, microeconomics applied to land tenure and in general ownership of buildings uh, on site uh, here, the, uh, in this con, in th this very context, we have most uh, of buildings belong to multiple people, to extended families. To, so it is very difficult to find an agreement uh, with all those people. Uh, here, the way also inheritance works is very different from, let's say, European or American standards. It's something that absolutely. Uh, one we have to one one of the aspects that most of times international projects here in the Middle East and in Arab countries 
neglect and instead is very important. Uh, here there is a, a, a good book that I might um, suggest as a, as a start starting that is law language and Islam. So uh, indeed the back side, the bad side of this is that um, development projects or initiatives that involve uh, uh, the restoration of buildings is more complicated than elsewhere, but also it goes through such a thick uh, negotiation that it kind of prevents or kind of uh, discourages or diminishes uh, the impact of gentrification. And here I make a parallel with, for example, the, the, the uh, situation in, uh, uh, in the area of Molenbeek in, in Brussels and the canal. Is completely different the, here that the gentrification dynamics that you see there are completely on but still there are other ways that they can be introduced indeed there is um um quite a hiring of uh, of uh, prices for um uh, for real estate trans transactions because this combines with new opportunities and families that are many owning one parcel and that often are in, let's say, precarious economic conditions. So this hires the prices when they see that there is possibility of, of being well paid. And on the other hand, there is a very typical game that this one, we also find it always in Europe, that uh, uh, you have people with, or, or agencies with uh, uh, with capital to be put on, on building and real estate activities that are going to propose um, an amount that for local families looks like, wow, this is very a very good deal. Uh, and instead is uh, underpriced, is not fair compared with the same properties uh, elsewhere. So um, what was happening uh, uh, now a little bit less in our in our neighborhood, I could see, I could say um, it happens less. But before many families ended up selling their property because the, the market was dormant. And uh, then they afterward realized that what they got uh, was less than expected and that they could afford a house only in the very outskirts of, uh, of the city. So losing all the social tissues, the habits. Yeah, it's something that we have, to, we constantly grow, go and scrutinize. One of the ways we intervene on this is to apply policies, uh, uh, price policies to um, our facilities. So to keep um, our uh, guest house in, within a certain um, average prices, for example, is a way to continue keeping in, bringing in a certain kind of users that needs to stay low budget. Same is for uh, our cafe uh, at, the, at the ground floor, uh, at the street level, that one, uh, uh, even if we, we now handed it uh, off to uh, 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 a group of, uh, of people that before used to come and have a coffee at our place, and then they decided to enter in the business. So we do not, we don't, we do nothing, but if they need uh, uh, like, um, a suggestion uh, built upon our experience, we just give it to them uh, and we provided a space without extra prices. We just ask them to keep their pr prices within a certain range. We measure it with simple benchmarks, like how, how much it costs uh, a coffee cup from a street vendor. We try to keep the same prices for a certain range of things. So to combine the benefits, enough benefit for the business so that it can continue to be profitable, but at the same time is accessible uh, to everyone and also to keep cultural activities and agenda of cultural activities for free in, on a regular basis. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's um, um, I find it very yeah, inspirating um, the way also you face all these challenges, which I guess are many. <laughs> And, and constant. Um, so yeah, we have a question from um, Claudia. 
Um, I should read it. Um, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you presented uh, the YALA project in the global arena at the Venice Biennale. Do you have to negotiate with the Biennale neoliberal agenda as well? And what is the difference between presenting the project to local uh, audiences in Palestine and in the global arena if uh, you present it differently? Thank you, Claudia, uh, for the question. Thanks, Claudia. Nice question. Um, we were lucky enough to be invited uh, as part of the Venice Biennale together with also um, uh, another uh, uh, reality from Brussels instead, uh, Global Roma, uh, and to be part of a Kai Leuven expedition in the place. So it was a one week residency and we were invited also by um, here, networking is so important, we understood. Um, the, the curator for the, uh, the San Marino Pavilion was also a former uh, Kai Leuven PhD uh, researcher. So he was really uh, friendly towards us, but also is a kind of, uh, of, of, of person that was is very much anti-neoliberal. Indeed, it opened many, many questions. That that week of residency, I think within all of us uh, participants to the residency uh, opened up uh, many, um, many ways of questioning our position within the international arena and within a quite new liberal now organization that is uh, the Venice Biennale. But uh, no, we. Uh, I would say that uh, the part of our self-sustainability is also um, focuses also on not uh, being willing to negotiate uh, our way of presenting us. We are also very rough, so um, I would say that we prefer something that makes less fashionable and sleek, uh, and, and instead uh, be like intelligible and understandable by the local audience, but also I, I build, we build on, on uh, especially my previous experience in, in, in uh, international uh, uh, exhibitions that was controversial as well. But it, it was a good question indeed, because often we kind of like posit uh, activities in a way that is more uh, sexy for the international uh, on this, I think we, we do not like to negotiate. We have to, to negotiate so much in the field that we say, okay, this is our content. This is what, what we want to say. You like it, we are going to make it nice. If you don't like it, we also don't need it, it means. But it means also to say not many opportunities. We had to, to drop several invitations that wanted to, uh, let's say, would pu put us in a question and on, on a questionable position. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. Sorry for that. Um, is there anybody who uh, would like to ask or share a comment or? I have a, maybe a last question because, okay, I, I um, if there is nobody else. Um, I was really interested in the way you, um, um, you talk about the, the, the everyday and the fact and, and the, the kind of approach uh, you developed uh, based on the, on the everyday. And this is uh, uh, really um, echoes also um, kind of my way of doing research. But uh, beyond that, um, you mentioned the fact that uh, being uh, constantly under the control and the scrutiny of uh, Israeli government and authorities uh, has as a consequence that people don't have a, a, a clear routine in their daily life and, and that the, the routine is something that uh, is challenging. Um, how, how do you, how is your, your personal experience of this? I mean, um, I guess, um, yeah, how how if you yeah, I'm interested interest also in the way um, uh, architects and also um, yeah people like you uh, experience like in 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 an embodied really way uh, your your daily work and and your engagement in in the field. 
Hmm. So, uh, is, is, is there a, is, this kind of lack of routine? Uh, is it a routine in itself uh, somehow or not at all? Well, I think we, we have a kind of double pace that we mix here. First, I think it's very important to uh, like to embrace as part of our, um, let's say, field based approach to question what is normality here. Everywhere you work, I see many, many names in the, in the audience that are from different, that, that inspire me different places in the world. Uh, normality is not one, and everydayness is not one. And even every neighbor has got its own small routine. You have like a, like micro, um, uh, micro rhythms and, um, uh, and micro metabolisms, I would say. So it's very important to understand this when we as if we work as as foreigners we are if we are out, outsiders or if we are locals it's important to at least be aware of it uh, then to work in a context like this means that to have a sort of like that routine is short-lived it changes often you do not know how long it's going to last and also i uh, here i bring in also my my um let's say more private uh, parts of my more private perspective of um, being a mother of, of a three less than three years still two two years old toddler uh, and being in a in a family that is uh, racially mixed and with with a different passports it means that just like yala project we are always living, every, everyone here is living uh, with a plan A, B, C, D, and ready to take it out anytime. You have the very, very worst scenario, and then you have uh, the fantastic scenario and everything that is in between. Once this, for example, I include uh, the fact that we put into, into consideration that perhaps um, uh, one of us, Especially, my could be rejected at the borders and banned for years. So even the kind of job and the kind of work that we have, it's ready to be unplugged and followed up remotely through someone else. Uh, I, but I, indeed, for uh, um, this is one of the hardest part to explain to international NGOs working here. I received many complaints. I heard, received in the sense that I heard many complaints from international and say oh but here it's impossible to work it's just a mess no it's another kind of 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 time planning that you that you in place mm -hmm. yeah thank you all thank you very much um thank you i think also to yeah for students to have um kind of equals about uh, how life is going on and and on a daily uh, basis uh, in, in, in your context would be also uh, not only useful, but uh, really inspiring to uh, you know, uh, imagine maybe uh, uh, the future uh, projects. If I can add just one last word, sure. because I also can see that uh, there are many colleagues uh, and fellow students that apparently from the name seem to be from like the, 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 the Belgian broad Belgian uh, area, Northern European. Uh, also, the kind, the, the idea of normality and routine is something that has to be tackled and decolonized, and we have to position honestly within it. W what I mean is that to have a routine and to have it, it's a privilege, and we have to be aware of it. Um, uh, recently, uh, I was uh, checking in the media, was interested more in this kind of apps about uh, making your your, your life more uh, efficient, etc. And you have all these apps that help you um, building routines, even like for mothers, uh, or if any of you has got children, and so, etc. Routine is something that is now so much advised. But it's something that not everyone can afford in so many parts of the world. So also, I think we have to like decolonize uh, and to understand the, the uh, our privilege also in this sense of having something that is that we can rely on and we can make plans for not only the in one week, 
but in one year, in 10 years, even thinking about a mortgage for buying a house or building a house is such a luxury, even just the, the possibility to think about it. And I'm not talking just about Palestine, but unfortunately, increasingly also in places like Europe, this thing is becoming challenging. If you think about the the, the crisis in, in the UK and the level of poverty that is now monitored, uh, it's it, it's something that we really have to tackle. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I, I've worked for a long time with uh, with Roma people uh, living in informal settlements who were evicted uh, on a constant basis. So there are many different um, yeah, contexts uh, we are not that much aware of, and we should really, uh, on the contrary, become aware of the fact that, as you said, Routine and, and making plans is is of course a privilege, and uh, in many parts of the world, including in many parts of Europe, and and yeah, absolutely. Um, and this idea of of, of the everyday um, is also part of this uh, decolonial process uh, of self decolonialization some, somehow. Well, I would. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I have many other questions, but um, yeah, um, I think we can. If nobody want to share um, a last word, or thank you for being there, everybody, and thank you very much, Alessandra. Um, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Elisabetta. Um, I really uh, hope we can students. we can meet in person one day. Hopefully, hopefully, um, hopefully we have plans to come and visit you. I will let you know. Indeed, <laughs> it will be a pleasure. <laughs> and yeah, thank you for uh, for sharing all all this. Um, yeah, all your experience. Thank you. Really. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening and for all your questions. And bye bye, everybody. I'll see you next uh, week. Indeed. And have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend, you all. You can bye. show up if you want just to say bye um, or not, but I think it's, it's not a problem kind of... if you're in your pajamas. Yeah, <laughs> but it's kind of nice to um, have a <laughs> see, see um, at least. <laughs> thank okay. you. Hey, thank you. But of course, if you are if you are uh, ever uh, interested in debating more, even to criticize it, please contact uh, contact us. You find us everywhere in the Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you have my email, so uh, please approach, ask whatever. No filters. Thank you. Bye. Thank everybody. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.